For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Mudli. Author Johnny Steinberg joins me today to discuss his book, Winnie and Nelson, Portrait of a Marriage. So you detail the early lives of both Winnie and Nelson Mandela, and Winnie's history went back to 1908. So what was the research process like for a book like this? Because you say that Mandela's memory can't be trusted, and Winnie herself kind of gave fictitious accounts to her biographers. Yeah, she did. So the more famous she became, the more she had to speak about herself, but the more she wanted to protect her privacy. And she protected her privacy by telling fictitious stories about her childhood. I understood why she was doing that. I had respect for that. But it made me into a bit of a detective because I wanted to know about her actual childhood. So I just went to Bizana, the, you know, the, the big town near where she grew up, and made contact with various of her cousins and began talking to them. Um, and discovered this remarkable family history that she hadn't quite concealed, but she'd, she'd um, kind of used it like putty and put into a new form. Um, so that was very exciting for me. It was early on in the research, and to discover something of Winnie Mandela's real family history, was it was just profoundly important to me because it began to explain who she became and why. Yeah, it was interesting to read about the role she played in her family early on and also her father. I think you mentioned that she sought approval from her father. Just tell us about that dynamic. So I think there are two really important things about her family, and one is that they were a vaultingly ambitious family. Her, it was only her grandfather's generation that learned to read and write. Yeah. And one generation later, in her father's generation, they were you know, supremely elite educated people. They were school principals and farm managers and bureaucrats. They were, the very, they were really a family that was soaring and they wanted their children to soar. And the other fact about the family is there were so many of them, there were 11 children, and the parents were completely unashamed that they were going to pick winners and going to forget everybody else. And so from an early age, Winnie knew that unless she occupied a central place in her parents' heads, she would, she would dissolve as a person, she would, she would be forgotten. Mm. Um, quite a rough world to grow up in and her mother died when she was nine and there was her father and she kind of understood that unless she became her father's most important child um, she was going to suffer and so from an early age she she developed this power of getting into somebody else's head and deciding what was going to happen there and, and and the first relationship was was her father but it went on throughout her life and it was massively successful with her father she she, in a strange way, became the prodigal son. She became the most educated child in the family. I don't think her father ever imagined that that would be a daughter's role. When he muscled in and, and, and became that person. Now, you also detailed the early courting stages between Winnie and Nelson. And you just say that the way she was depicted was her being shy and naive. And you say that they played into that, that perception of her. Why? So. The, Superficially on the outside, it looked like such a familiar story. She was in her late teens, uh, maybe 20 years old when they met. He was 38. He was a big man, a famous man, a glamorous lawyer. And they just told this familiar tale of a powerful older man sweeping a naive young woman off her feet. And, and the real story was in a way too scandalous for them to actually tell publicly or even to each other for a while, which is that she learned very early on as a very young woman the power of her sexuality, really. And she used it to great effect. And what was really happening is that she was engaged to Nelson and to another man at the same time, and she was playing the two off each other. And as a woman in the 1950s, a woman who, who believed the fact that she was female should not prevent her from exercising power or public office, all she really had at her disposal was her beauty and her sexuality, and she she used it, she mastered it, and used it to get what she wanted, which I admire her for enormously. It was just, it's, a, it's amazing to watch it happen through Nelson Mandela's eyes. And is that why you wrote, she became a ferocious enforcer of conservative sexual mores among young black South Africans, even while she flouted sexual norms herself? Yeah, she was, she was always, she, was, she had a really aristocratic sense of herself. She believed that rules didn't apply to her. And, and that's why we know who she is today, that's why we're discussing her today, is because she was, she was prepared to go to the brink. Can you tell us a bit about Ruth Mompati, um, her role in the struggle and her relationship with Nelson Mandela? Because I found that hers was one of the saddest stories that I read about. Yeah, it's really sad. So 
when William Nelson met, Nelson was, was married um, to, to a woman called Evelyn Masse and they had three children. And their, their marriage was falling to pieces and ended very, very badly. And part of the reason it ended is that Nelson had many other lovers while he was married to Evelyn. And one of them was Ruth Mompati. They met because she became a secretary at Mandela's law firm. There were quite difficult things happening in her life. Her own marriage was falling apart. She felt a bit embarrassed to be the lover of this famous playboy. Um, but it sounds like it was a really substantial relationship. At one point she talks about her and Nelson driving in his car where they could be alone to, to into the countryside and imagining a new world together beyond apartheid. It sounds like it was quite a lovely relationship, but she had his child. And when the ANC was banned, um, Mandela and Sisulu convinced her to leave her children in South Africa and go into exile and get a military training. And that she really didn't want to do it, um, but she re reluctantly agreed on the promise that she'd be back within a year. And in the end, she didn't see her children for over a decade um, until they eventually joined her in exile. In, and um, I mean, the tragedy of that story is just beyond telling. By the time her children came back to her, by the time they were reunited, she felt she didn't know them anymore and, and they didn't know her. Um, and she felt she never really bonded with him again. It's a, it's a terrible story. Now, back to Winnie, you write about her beauty and that she was courted by many men. So then, why then did she choose Mandela and her father didn't approve either, yet she sought his approval? I think it's, it's complicated. I mean, why people fall in love is complicated and they were very, very attracted to each other. The relationship between them was electric. But I think mixed up in that attraction, the fact that he was very powerful and was going to be an important leader mattered to her a great deal. And she understood that as a woman, that was her route into leadership herself. I'm not even sure if it was entirely conscious, but I think it's part of what was so attractive about him. And another reason is, in a way, I think she was getting some revenge on her father. Um, you know, she'd had to work her way into her father's mind in order to succeed. He was the one who called the shots. And he, at this point, was about to join, join the apartheid project. He was going to become a cabinet minister in the Bantustan Transkai cabinet. Nelson Mandela was a leader in the ANC. And when he discovered that, uh, that his daughter was going to marry Nelson Mandela, he was shocked and hurt and upset and begged her not to do it. And, and I think that just made her more resolved. She was, she was really taking revenge on her father by marrying Nelson Mandela. Mm. Now, briefly tell us about Barbara Harmel, um, a young white woman, and she gave you some interesting insights into Winnie's character, especially in contrast with the controversy around the Mandela United Football Club that shrouded Winnie. Uh, Barbara painted a sort of caring picture of Winnie. Well, Winnie had a, an amazing, amazing capacity to, to really climb into the heads of other people especially people who were vulnerable and needy, somebody, people who wanted something. She had this instinct to know that they were needy and really become what they needed. And so as a young woman, she and Nelson would go for Sunday lunches to the Harmel House. Uh, Barbara's parents were leaders of the South African Communist Party. And, and at this stage, Nelson's peers thought that Winnie was just a pretty, silly, airheaded young girl. Um, and Nelson would go off to talk politics and Winnie would go to Barbara's room. Barbara was a mixed up 16 year old teen. And Barbara, as an, as an old woman, described to me just what happened when Winnie sat down with her on her bed. She said that Winnie was the first adult in her life who really saw inside her, um, saw all the conflict and the trauma and the mixed upness and just held her in her thoughts and kind of became a, a substitute mother almost overnight. And Barbara was one of many people who relayed that sort of experience to me, this, this incredible interpersonal power. Um, how did you go about tracing the detail that Thabo Mbeke and others in the ANC did not trust Winnie Mandela? Um, and the apartheid security police tried to use this to their advantage? So it, it happened very early because while Nelson was still standing trial in the early 1960s, um, Winnie began a, an affair with a man called Brian Samana. Um, who ironically, Nelson had assigned to look after his wife and children while he was gone. And it turned out that Brian Samano was a police informer, um, and two men went to jail because of him. 
Uh, and at this point, a delegation went to see Winnie and said, you must end your relationship with this man. And she said, nobody tells me what to do. And she kept on seeing him. And, and the repercussions, it was scandalous. And, and the repercussions followed Winnie for years. You know, people like Lenin and Goy and Albertina Sisulu refused to work with her after that. And so Winnie set up an underground network herself in isolation. And her isolation got her into real trouble. Uh, she was surrounded by informers in her network. They were telling the police what was going on. She was finally arrested and interrogated in 1969. And her interrogator knew so much about intimate stuff about her and, and really used that against her. So there's a, there's a direct connection between her, I guess, her political inconsistency, um, her political strangeness. You know, why did she stay with this informer? She's a very complicated person. And just how vulnerable she became. Now, in writing this book, which also details intimate conversations between Winnie and Nelson Mandela, what are you hoping people understand about their relationship or take away from their relationship? So while I was researching this book, I discovered that there were transcripts of private conversations that they'd had when she came to see him in prison um, that were available and that I could read. I mean, private in a complicated sense because they knew that their conversations were being recorded, which makes them quite hard to interpret. But at times they seemed to forget the bugs were there. Things got so volatile and heated. And reading these transcripts, you can, I mean, this was the only forum in which they could conduct their marriage. And you, you really get a front row seat to what is going on. And it's very uncomfortable and unpleasant. There's Nelson's relationship with his daughter breaking down. Mm -hmm. um, there's all the cruelty and deceit and manipulation when he's hiding a lot of stuff from him, a lot of hurtful stuff. Um, and, and I guess the decision was whether to use this material, which is very intrusive and intimate. And, I guess the most honest answer is that I used it because it was there and I was writing a book about the marriage. Um, but my responsibility was to use it as sympathetically as I could. And I think that one thing that comes out of that material is, is a real uh, visceral sense of how much Nelson Mandela suffered in prison. Um, you know, he was so famous and so glamorous that one forgets that to be Divorced from one's life for 27 years is, is an act of extreme cruelty. And, and in those transcripts, you can really see the effects. You can see how cruel it is. You can see how this is a man who, while he's becoming world famous, is also losing control of his life and losing his control over his relationship with the people closest to him. And you can, you see the tragedy frontally. You, you really see what it's about. And, and, and I think that now that he's dead, that material can be out there. You can actually see what, what happened to him, what he went through. That was author Johnny Steinberg discussing his latest book, Winnie and Nelson, Portrait of a Marriage.